Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Leaps of Knowledge, Episode A Masterclass, The Pedagogy of Compassion by Professor Colin Diamond. Thank you so much for joining us today. And my name is Kathleen, and I'm your host for this session. All day today, at Leaps of Knowledge, Episode A, we have been exploring the value of act with integrity. And we ask the question, how do we support students to navigate and leverage the benefits of today's digital world? With the world heading towards digital transformation and AI technology, what we have as the core of who we are as human beings are our moral character and values. Our survival depends upon creating a compassionate world and an education system that incorporates compassion for self, for others, and for the planet. So we are so pleased today to have in this masterclass as the final event for today, an incredible lineup of thought leaders to go deeper into this topic. Um, but before we start, there's some housekeeping rules. So please feel free to use the uh, Q&A function to ask questions. Um, any questions that you have of, uh, for Professor Colin or for the other panelists. And uh, you can also use the chat function to interact with one another and for, for you know, just to discuss uh, something between each of you. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Now, let me start um, this masterclass um, by introducing our speaker for today, which is Professor Colin Diamond. Um, he's a special friend and a real expert in this area. So um, just to tell you something about him, Professor Colin Diamond is a professor of educational leadership at the University of Birmingham. He, was, he has over 40 years of educational leadership experience, starting as a secondary school teacher. So you know, he was really empathetic with all of you who are teachers here today, and he has held various roles since. In 2014, his work in the wake of the Trojan horse crisis led to his appointment as Deputy, Deputy Education Commissioner for Birmingham. In 2015, he was appointed as Executive Director of Education in Birmingham to deliver the Education Improvement Plan signed off by the Secretary of State. In 2016, he received a CBE medal in the Queen's Birthday Honours. He co-authored the book, Education for Survival, The Pedagogy of Compassion, with 15 other authors, which he will be walking us through today. So let us all give a very warm welcome to Professor Colin Diamond. Okay, um, that's in Kathleen. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. And uh, from Birmingham in the UK, um, from our university, which you can see behind me, a very, very warm welcome. It's a privilege to be invited to join you all today. I've, I've been watching the chat line and I see we have colleagues from all over Southeast Asia, from, from uh, the subcontinent, uh, from the Middle East. Uh, so we truly have a global audience. So um, this morning, uh, I'll be talking for about 10 minutes or so. I have some slides to share with you. And Adrian will kindly now start with the first slide. Okay, you should now all be able to see the opening slide, which is a rather dramatic one. And I've, I've done this deliberately. So that I'm a visual learner. And in the center there, you can see uh, this is a picture taken a few weeks ago, rather sadly, a picture of what's happening in California right now. Um, colleagues and friends, the planet is on fire in places it shouldn't be. Uh, we have fires in California, Canada, and most recently in Russia, in Siberia. Um, in 2020, uh, I was in Australia myself, in Southeast Australia, and saw, saw firsthand the damage that such fires can cause right across that part of the country. Simultaneously, in China and in Germany, we have unprecedented flooding and storms. And above us all, in the far north, the polar ice cap is melting at an alarming rate. Currently, the planet is heading to increase by over 1.5 degrees Celsius this century, and that is not sustainable. 
That background <clears throat> tells us why we have the book to my left, Education for Survival. This is the latest edition in our Compassionate Education series, which started a decade ago with Towards the Compassionate School. Uh, right now, we are driven unashamedly and explicitly by climate change. And our belief is that young people can and must be engaged in the custodianship of our beautiful planet. And the picture on the right, of course, we will all recognize Greta Thunberg, the schoolgirl from Sweden, who single-handed started a global movement. So if any of us ever feel we can't influence or change anything, just remember Greta, what she started as a 14-year-old girl in Sweden. Now, this slide links together three important initiatives. On the left, of course, we have our book, Education for Survival. It links very closely with the work of the Jubilee Center at the University of Birmingham, which is all about character and virtues. And our host today, uh, that in Kathleen, has seen firsthand the work of the Jubilee Center across many, many schools in the UK. The next logo down is from UNICEF. Uh, as I will talk about in a few minutes, we do a lot of work uh, based on the UN Children's Rights Charter and introducing the Rights Respecting Award into many schools in Birmingham. In fact, this happens right across the UK. Um, education for Survival, the Pedagogy of Compassion, the Teaching of Compassion, uh, the work of the Jubilee Centre on Character, and the work on young people knowing and respecting their rights are all intimately linked. So what, is, what do we mean? What is this phrase pedagogy of compassion all about? Well, first of all, it has strong background in psychodynamics. And for our purposes today, this goes right back to Sigmund Freud's work where we began to understand the dynamics of human relationships, how we relate to each other, why we relate to each other, why we behave in certain ways. So uh, the grandfather of it all, Sigmund Freud. To bring that more up to date, um, I've mentioned attachment here, theory here. Um, the modern father, if you like, of, of attachment theory was a gentleman called John Bowlby, who I was lucky enough to meet in my training in London many years ago. Yes, I have been involved for over 40 years, Kathleen, in this field. Um, and he wrote a book called The Making and Breaking of Affectional Bonds. And what he's saying there, and this is what attachment theory is all about, is that if you are lucky enough as a, a baby, as a very young person, to have secure attachment through your mother in the first place, that will put you in good stead for the rest of your life. That initial attachment is absolutely critical. Um, and we build outwards from there when we move out into uh, early life at school, uh, nursery, kindergarten, right through to that phrase about self-actualization, which is really becoming the authentic you in your young adult life. We have a little pyramid diagram there, which shows uh, we like that because it's quite simple in terms of um, we have at the base, you yourself. It's important you understand yourself, you value yourself, because once that is in place, you can then share what you have with others initially through your family, through your closest friends at kindergarten. That then moves out as you get older, as you're introduced into the community that you live with. And we always say the community that you serve as a young person. The notion of service is very important here. Moving from your immediate community, we look at the wider place, in our case, the city of Birmingham, about a million people at the moment. And then finally, we move towards being uh, compassionate about the planet. We do teach this explicitly. Uh, it's not a little bolt on on the end. Uh, and I, I, I know there are questions about this. So how does this relate to what we will call traditional established subject teaching? The answer is, and we may explore this later, 
they sit together very nicely indeed. They're entirely compatible. And we argue, based on our evidence of our research, that teaching compassion actually adds value in a way that improves traditional subject teaching. And as I said earlier, we've updated our take on what the pedagogy of compassion is about because of the planetary crisis. This one illustrates briefly uh, what we call the near model. This is getting down into more practical methods about how you work compassion in the classroom. Just to pick out a few phrases here. Uh, so observational listening is critical in a compassionate classroom. Listening to what others are saying, what others are doing. Uh, building relationships is really important. You're not just there in class for you, yourself, and what you learn. It's about working with, understanding with, caring for, and loving others in your community. And of course, reflecting on our own change and growth. Uh, next slide, please. I will accelerate slightly, otherwise my 10 minutes will be up soon. So these next three slides are ones that we use with schools when we're working with schools as a kind of self-audit tool. And if we were all sitting together, and one day this will happen, I hope, if we were in downtown KL at the moment or wherever we are, we would sit and look at, okay, so what is a compassionate child or young person using these kind of definitions? And just to pick out one or two phrases. I think these are gold dust. A young person who sees kindness as a strength, as somebody you would want on side, somebody you'd want in your tent, somebody you'd want to work with. Um, a young person who is able to see things from multiple perspectives and is non-judgmental. Gosh, isn't that about maturity? Isn't that what we want amongst ourselves as adults? So these are the kind of characteristics we develop and look for in young people. It is an audit tool that you can use. And of course, you have these, have these slides, of course. Um, moving on, please, Adrian. The next one is a bit broader. This is about a school. What does a compassionate school look like? So you can, I'm not going to read through all of these, um, but let's just, just, just start with the first one. Um, students think and work as we and not just me. Now, there are many teachers here today. We know, um, I taught in London for many years in secondary school, tough secondary schools, that getting the we into it, introducing if effective, authentic group work where students are working for each other is a higher order teaching skill. No apologies about that. It's easier to have traditional one, two, three, four in a row. Of course it is. So a compassionate school is one with all of these characteristics. Moving on, please. I think the next one is about leadership. Yes, compassionate school leaders. And this is what we, we teach a lot back home in, in, in the UK. We know from countless research studies that the leader in the school creates the climate, the ethos, the values. So it's critical that school leaders, for us, consider all of these characteristics and as part of their mentoring, their coaching, their professional development, move in this direction. There is no council of perfection here. It's not something you achieve overnight. It's something that you will find in mature, road-tested, well-established leaders, that something they'll pick up en route. Because I'm aware that I'm <laughs> over time now, 12 minutes. Um, in Birmingham, uh, going back to 2014, we had a little bit of a breakdown in relationships between some parts of the community and uh, the local government and, and central government. We needed a method that would bring the school communities together. And we decided to work with the UNICEF Rights Respecting Schools Award. Out of a, out of a total of 450 state schools, government schools in Birmingham, now over 300 have volunteered to ad adopt the Rights Respecting Schools Award because it works for us in our multicultural setting in Birmingham. And fundamentally, it gives young people a sense of themselves, a sense that they belong in our communities, no matter what part of the world they come from, what faith, 
they have in their community or no or no faith for that matter um and doesn't matter whether they are the most affluent or a bit cash poor everyone comes together through working through the rights respecting school award it's what i call the impact slide head teachers school teachers want to know when you talk about something that's new when you're talking about the curriculum does it work does it make a difference in my school in my classroom the answer positively unalloyed fantastically so is yes 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 um this was a, a, a an early survey based on 75 schools in 2017 you can see there this is head teachers talking not us the positive impact on relationships, positive attitudes towards diversity, young people respecting themselves and others. And of course, the knock on effect, the bonus effect here is a higher engagement in learning. And in terms of the culture of the school, three quarters of head teachers here are saying that it reduced the need to exclude from school and bullying within the school. That's pretty powerful data by any stretch of the imagination. I often finish on this one. You'll see why in a second. This is one of our favorite songs. Of course, you recognize Bob Marley. Of course, you recognize One Love. Um, it's our anthem, if you like, because we, we use the, love, the word love because we can't teach effectively unless we love the people we work with. That's true for me at university. It's true in kindergarten. It's true for all of you as teachers. You have to love the people you're working with. It, what, it is literally what makes the world go around in our classrooms. And the compassion of pedagogy, the values, the character, young people's rights, caring for each other. Yeah, that, that picture of Bob Marley. Uh, I did see him when I was a young student at University of Kathleen. I did see him perform. That stays with me. So on that note, uh, I will cease talking and hand back to you, please, Datin. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have more time for you because I think there's just so much more to delve into. And, uh, you know, you've given us just snippets of this insight and we just really love to explore more of it during the next half an hour. And of course, um, We'll bring on our other panelists as well. And I think there's just so, you know, it, what, what you've just um, outlined, there's so much richness there. So I'm going to now invite our other panelists um, into the session. And first we have uh, Dr. Go Chi Leong. Um, Dr. Go is joining us. He is the group CEO of XCL Education Malaysia which owns and manages four leading K-12 education brands, GKDU, Real Kids, Real Schools, and Cambridge for Life. Welcome, Dr. Go. Thank Dr. you Go, so much, Martin. Uh, yeah, he has served as the project lead for eight UNICEF projects in Malaysia, and as an external consultant and trainer with many companies. His areas of spe specialization include the application of psychology to change management, talent management, education, and leadership. He holds a PhD in psychology from the University of Otago. And then um, we also have with us today, very privileged to have Kevin Fulbrook, who is the director of Al Bayan Bilingual School in Kuwait. He started his career as a maths and physical education teacher how all teachers should start really doing math and physical education <laughs> in a remote Australian school. Uh, he then taught at a range of schools across the country before serving in leadership positions in Australia, China, and the Middle East. Having participated in the think tank um, on global education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in 2016, Kevin then went on to be named as the Educator Magazine's Rising Stars of Education under 40 years old. He's also a country lead ambassador for 100.org out of Finland and a lead learning architect with Learn Life Spain. So good afternoon. Um, welcome again to Dr. Go uh, and to Kevin. And uh, we are now having a wonderful panel from uh, Birmingham, Professor Colin from um, Kuwait, Kevin, and of course our very own um, Dr. Go Chilio. So I think maybe just to start, um, to give the audience here today 
a flavor of um, who you are and what you're passionate about. Um, can I ask uh, first maybe um, Dr. Go and later Kevin to just tell us a little bit about yourselves and what really drives you, you know, in education and what areas are you exploring now um, in innovation or um, yeah, whatever your, your passions are in education. Dr. Go. Thank you so much, Datin, uh, and thank you, everybody. I, as, as you've introduced, my background is really in cognitive psychology. And so I think I began 20 years in the university and largely really focusing on how psychology can be applied to different fields and, and how it can be, in a sense, applied to making a better community, you know, a better society, a better planet, very much uh, what Professor Colin shared earlier. And uh, the last 10 years, I've shifted to K-12. So I focused on younger populations, you know, I've worked with UNICEF, uh, and I think the key is really, for me, the interest in creating uh, a different kind of a school that is not just focused uh, very narrowly on academic performance per se, but a school that is perhaps more holistic, a school that prepares children for the real world, uh, a, a, a school that prepares children to make a better world. Uh, and so I, I think some of the things that, again, Professor Colin has shared in terms of a compassionate school uh, culture, uh, you know, how do we uh, encourage and inspire children and students to be change agents? Uh, these are my interests right now. Thank you, Dr. Go. And Kevin, can we find out a little bit more about you? Yes, thank you for the warm welcome. I'm not sure there's too much more I can add. Um, I, I love working in schools. I've worked in schools for over 20 years now, and it's I really love just the dynamic nature of education. Uh, for those of you in the watching today who work in schools, uh, you never know as you turn up to work every day what that day is going to hold for you. Every day is, is different, and that's really what I love about it. When you work with young people and you work with other uh, like-minded, passionate educators, um, it really every day, and not to say every day is wonderful or every day is fun. There are some challenging days, but there's some amazing days as well. And, and that's what I love about it. At the moment, I'm, I'm uh, really interested in examining how design thinking and how the educators in schools, not just teaching design thinking to students, but how we can mobilize the wonderfully talented staff we have in schools uh, around a design thinking approach to solve some of the challenges that we have, particularly with the, the pandemic and other things going on around the world, how we can get small groups of, of um, diverse people together to solve in short turnaround times and iterative cycles some of the, uh, the really tricky challenges that we face uh, in schools. And that's what really interests me at the moment. Thank you so much. Um, for introducing yourselves. And uh, so I think let's get right into the meat of this. The compassionate child, the compassionate school, the compassionate school leader. Surely that is something that we all aspire to. I think naturally, I mean, just listening to Professor Colin, you know, that, that seems to me such an ideal. But in reality, I think we know that, that doesn't happen all the time in the schools. And maybe, you know, I'd like to hear from you, what has failed us in the school systems around the world? I mean, you're each in a different school system, that this is not the case, that every school you step into, you know, is a compassionate school, full of compassionate leaders and children. Um, can, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask Dr. Go to start with, since you know, I think that's one of your missions in your school to actually build this. So perhaps a contrast between what you saw before in other systems and what you're doing now. So I think, I think part of the challenge perhaps is the fact that um, a lot of parents uh, and other stakeholders, including school leaders and sometimes even governments of countries, the way we are evaluating the success of a school tends to be more narrow, you know? And, and, and so I think in this world where we talk about KPIs and goals and objectives and performance matrices, unfortunately, the focus of these matrices tend to be academic success, examination performances. And so I think from the principals down to the teachers, but, but I think we need to admit as parents as well, the parent community also tends to be very focused on 
one aspect of school development, which is academic performance, and, and therefore other parts of child development are neglected, including things like compassion and values, you know, and, and aspects of psychosocial development. So I, I would say as a general statement, that's probably the challenge in most countries in the world. And it's, I think, a shared responsibility. It's not just the school authorities or the ministries of education. It's also parents, because the parents are the ones that are pushing for, you know, I, we all want our children to get into the best universities, into the Ivy Leagues, into the Oxbridges, and the Oxbridges are taking straight A students, you know. And so in the end of the day, the, the formula becomes, how does the school get you your 10 A stars or your four A stars? And nothing else matters because that's what the universities are evaluating. So I think until that cycle can be broken, it's going to be very difficult to sort of get people to pay attention in time or resources to other things, including compassion. Yeah, so Professor Colin, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more about, um, you know, I mean, you talk about the, it starts, you know, in the early years with the child. So yes, whilst the systems all want to produce individuals that all go to Harvard and Oxbridge and, you know, have those 10A stars, but is there a contradiction between, you know, starting young, making the child compassionate? And then, you know, does that then work against what we're going to see as the end product? I mean, if you're looking at the child as a product of the education system. Gosh, that is a very wide question perspective. Um, and I, I wish we had about 10 hours today, actually, <laughs> um, because, because, of course, uh, what uh, Chi Long said is absolutely right. Um, school leaders, uh, like he himself and like Kevin, uh, uh, are expected to get results from their schools. Of course, we, we know that. So we're, this is no kind of idle romance. The real world says you need to get results, of course. Um, I think working in the early years, um, there is, of course, the, the curriculum is, is play-based. You, the young, you, you learn best by experimentation and by play, and we have to give that full reign in the early years. So the qualities of like knowing how to play together, sharing together, being social together, overall well-beingness are valued more, I would say, in the, in the early years. And somehow along the track, we can lose them if we're not, if we're not careful. Um, Again, as Chi Long said, the um, schools have, a, uh, certainly in England, have a very narrow scorecard in terms of how they are assessed by governments and by inspectors. Um, and, and what we argue and what we look for, and this is possible, schools can do this within, and, you know, they, they have the autonomy to do this, is have a much broader balanced scorecard. So whereby, yes, uh, and you are looking to assess health and well-being. The, the emotional health of the school community. You are looking for participation in team sports events, in different kinds of sports events, um, community productions, arts, drama, and so forth. And also, as I touched on in my, my brief presentation, uh, how much you give to the community, how much of your time you're out there. For example, helping the elders in the community. Now, these are infinitely valuable characteristics and behaviors what we argue is and this is the holy grail for me when you get those things right you are creating a more authentic climate for learning you don't really learn when you're under unhappy when you're, you're under duress when you're under pressure you get you get the culture of the school right which is a generous outward looking school and as night follows day I can guarantee, because we've got research evidence on this, that the results will overall improve. Now, just one final thought. In terms of Oxbridge, yes, of course, we understand, I believe, Oxbridge and so forth. Um, a very small percentage of students will, will be able to, to go to these universities. In, in our country, about 50% of students overall go to university. We have to care for the 100%. We have to remember the 100%, because those who don't go to university are the people who, broadly speaking, keep our society going. The reason I have a laptop in front of me, a table in front of me, food in the fridge, uh, the letters arrive, the house is in good order, is because of those people who don't actually go to university. And I think we should be equally valuing their contribution to society. I think what we're talking about here will, will help that process. Thank you. Thank you. And, and then maybe Kevin, I know you have two young children. 
And so you, you're kind of looking at this as a, from the perspective of a parent, I mean, which uh, Chirum talked about, you know, that parents are kind of, you know, that they are another lobby group for schools to be more academic. Um, but you're a parent, you're a teacher. Um, yeah, maybe we can have your perspective on this. Yeah, well, I certainly agree with everything Dr. Go and uh, Professor Colin have said in that I think there's a bit of a false narrative that there's a it's a choice to make where you, you can either have um, high academics or you have something that's focused on on compassion and kindness, but you can't have both. And I, and I think that's just not the case. And because, it, as Colin mentioned earlier, they, they really are complementary. Um, you really can have it all. And, and that's where schools and school communities, including the parents and the educators and the students coming together to work out what that looks like for them. Because, you know, from what I've seen from, from my perspective in, in, in many, many schools that those students that are, are kind and compassionate, they also tend to have those, uh, as Colin was mentioned earlier, as part of his model, those higher order thinking skills that go along with that, the evaluating and reflecting and analyzing and, and you know, critical analysis um, are, are really, uh, really important academic skills and are going to serve them well in that domain. So I, I think we need to get away from, you know, saying that these things are on, on different ends of a spectrum, I think is the wrong kind of conversation. They're all complementary and you really can um, look at models that, that uh, encourage and develop all of these different things in our, in our young people. Um. Okay, I'm sure there are a lot of educators out there and parents who are listening in today, and they might want to know, I mean, what are the strategies that you have used in your school, you know, to create this balance, to value um, these character um, um, traits, as well as to push the kids, you know, to achieve as much as they can achieve academically? Yeah, well, look, I think it's a, it's a couple of main things. And I think one of them Colin hit on the head before is about explicitly teaching them um, these skills and these attributes and these attitudes and, and these approaches. What does kindness and compassion, what does it look like? And what does it sound like? And what does it feel like? And for young people seeing the adults in their school or in their settings actually being role models and displaying these, because we all know kids... They won't necessarily listen to what we say, but they'll follow our actions. They'll see what we do. And those are, that's the, the, the real things that we matter. So, you know, what we talk about a lot as, as educators and, and, and teachers and leaders in schools is if we're saying these things are important, these espoused values or guiding statements in our school, then they have to be our enacted values and our um, enacted approaches, we need to live it ourselves and, and be the role models for our children, our young people in school, and we need to explicitly teach it. So put in place programs where it's an embedded part of the, the program. As, as Colin said earlier, it can't be a bolt-on or an add-on thing. Okay, now we're going to do our part of the lesson that's focused on compassion. No, it has to be embedded within it because once our young people leave school, all of these things are all mixed together, you know, subject areas aren't separated out all of these things aren't separate finite parts of our lives they're all intertwined and, and we have to get our young people ready to uh, uh, practice that and, and to live that yeah. i mean that, that takes me back to really what um, earlier today um during the um, episode a we heard professor colin talk about the framework at the jubilee center where for character development where it's uh Taught, there's uh, you know um, character is taught, um, character is caught, and then finally character is sought. And uh, yeah, um, maybe Chi Long. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure you, um, in your school strategy, you know, whether you call it in the same kind of three pillars or you do something different, you know, tell us about how you do it at the XCL schools. So certainly, I think that the concept and the ideas are, are very similar. I mean, the process and the outputs may be a bit different, but I, I think we start with the idea of seeing with compassion, you know, and, and so the eyes are very important. And, and in a sense, it's almost as though coaching and encouraging our students to see with eyes of compassion. And so how they see other people in their class, in their community, to me, that's the starting point. Because often if they are seen as competitors, 
if they are seen as people who are different, people who are threats to me, then that's where the problem begins. You know, that's the, that's the barrier to kindness and connection. And so if the starting point is to understand the needs and to see with compassion, so that what we, you know, uh, see across the board are human beings with needs like ours, and therefore as, as a human, fellow human being, then I see my role. And, and I, I like the point that Kevin made, which is, so, you know, it's the key is ensuring that children don't see success as counter opposed to kindness and helping other people. In fact, the way we redefine success should be collective and, and moving away from just then individual glory and success, but saying that real success and, and real excellence is when I bring out the best in other people, when I help meet the needs of others. So when I see with compassion and I realize that my classmates, my teachers, my parents, you know, and, and as Professor Collins says, as the circle becomes bigger and I, I start to be conscientized to the needs around in my bigger community. As, as I define success as helping meet the needs of others, helping connect so that I bring out the best in others. And I'm, I'm playing my role in creating the school environment, the city environment, the country environment, the world environment that I want to live in. I, I think that's the key. And of course, we do that in, you know, whether it's in the classroom, as Kevin has said, you know, it can begin with some exposure, which is really, really important. Uh, one of the things that I've seen as the most powerful tools that have transformed, you know, lives of students, you know, and so sometimes we, we've got some students who are really quite sheltered, you know, very, very protected, you know, and, and sometimes from very, very upper income groups, you know, so they're not exposed to the needs of, let's call it the real world. And, and to me, you know, taking them out. And, and so whether, whether these are, are trips, visits, you know, community engagement, uh, you know, uh, uh, platforms, uh, they never come back the same. And again, it's about, you know, uh, exposing them in a way that changes their worldview and changes the way they see other people. You know, when, when I was in school, I went to a convent school and we never got accolades uh, for academic excellence. There was no prize given. So the nun who was our principal said, you know, if that wasn't, she, she, she saw that as a natural talent. If you just naturally write, you know, why should I give you a prize? But she gave prizes for extracurricular activities. You know, those were deemed to be a lot more important, how you work in teamwork. And yeah, but I mean, would that be a radical suggestion today that, you know, especially say in Malaysian schools, where it's very, mm -hmm. you know, uh, prescribed, you know, you get, there is a day in the school calendar that you honor academic achievement, but as well as school curricula. Um, you know, maybe parents would be a bit shocked if their child who got first in class wasn't given a prize. Um, and, and, any comments? <laughs> and, and just to, to add to that, you know, so that this is where there's a disconnect sometimes between the school culture and the real world. Because when you think of a corporate culture, so whether they're working in NGOs or organizations, and you think about who are our star performers, leaders or, or staff, these are the people who bring out the best in their teams, you know. It's very rare, right? that the people who rise to the top of the organization are people who are selfish and self-centered and only doing their work, right? Working in silos. I mean, that's sort of the, you know, that's sort of the, you know, no, no boss likes that. So if you think about it, if parents really want children to succeed in the real world, actually exactly that in Catalin, we should be celebrating these traits, you know, and celebrating students who say, look, this classmate of mine helped me through my math. You know, I wouldn't have passed math or science without their help. And I want to actually pay testimonial and homage. And I think that's the kind of compassionate school environment we want to create. And we would say to parents who even who are the most pragmatic parents who want their children to succeed, we would say that's exactly how they would succeed in the real world, because these are the kind of people that become leaders and become successful. Yeah, so we're going to go into a time soon of Q&A, um, with I think that there seems to be quite a few questions coming up. But before then, um, Colin, you know, would you have some final words um, before we open this, the floor up to the audience? Well, I'm, I'm enjoying listening to what uh, Chi Long and Kevin and yourself, Kathleen, are bringing to, to the table here today. I think we have a rich conversation. Um, 
A story I tell briefly um, is of a, an eight-year-old girl I met in a school in, in downtown Birmingham in a quite cash-poor part of the city. She herself is from uh, the uh, British Pakistani uh, Kashmiri community. And it was a very hot day by our standards in, in July. And she was standing by the water cooler getting a drink. And just above the water cooler, there was a poster, uh, a UNICEF poster. And of course, one of the children's rights across the world is the right to have good water, clean water to drink, good food to eat. And she said, sir, um, we uh, said, how are you? You know, and she said, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just getting some water. She said, you know, there are children around the world who don't have access to clean water. We take it for granted here. And so what we're doing, sir, is uh, we have a bring and buy sale at lunchtime to raise some funds so we can send money to UNICEF so that they can help communities that don't have water like we have here. And I thought, gosh, that sums it up to me. That's what education is really, really about. I think with her wisdom and compassion as an eight-year-old, she has the potential to go on to be a global leader, exactly as Ji Long was describing a few moments ago. I was struck when, uh, we're not talking politics here today, but when Vice President Kamala Harris were, was at the inauguration, she tweeted three words, here, to serve and servant leadership is back and this is about serving the community to make it a better community and i get quite emotional just saying those three words um so uh my final comment uh let's trust in the young people let's bring them on and they can ultimately save our planet if we get it right thank you thanks colin so i think yeah let's start with questions from the floor um, um, the first one from Denise says, in our culture, sometimes being kind is not what is being taught because of the competitive, uh, of the competition and comparison that parents do. How can we teachers help parents see the importance of compassion? I think we kind of touched on that, but maybe if, if anyone has anything more precise um, advice to offer, how do you help parents overcome this competitiveness? I mean, may, maybe just to start, um, one of the things we do is we do a lot of parent outreach. So a lot of uh, webinar sessions over the last, you know, five, 10 years. Uh, and we realize that, look, the starting point is parents do want their children to live a full and happy life, right? So I think with some coaching and prompting, we are able to bring parents to the conclusion that, you know, if you take away all of the distractions, of you know, influence from family members, from their own dreams, and they put that aside. And they say, look, what I really want for my child is that my child, I want my child to live a happy and a full life and to find their own pathway, right? And I think if that's the starting point for parents, I guess this is where then we tie in and say, look, in order therefore to give your child the best opportunity to live this, let's call it a full and meaningful and fulfilling life, they can't do that when they are alienated from the society and the world around them. And so the importance of compassion, not just in terms of a broader global sense, but in terms of being able to have healthy relationships with their family members and their friends and their future life partners if they choose to. You know, I think to me, that's the starting point. So, so when parents see that, yes, this is actually very much in line with what they want for their children, which is happiness in the end. And that without, when you take away compassion, you know, so this is not just about, you know, so that the child, you know, becomes a world leader or the child becomes famous or the child becomes a CEO. We say, look, it's not even about that. It's the fact that when you're not having healthy relationships with anybody in your life, it doesn't matter what you end up doing, you're not going to be happy. And therefore, you know, this idea of compassion and empathy and all of these things we're talking about are actually the basic psychological build, building blocks that enable you to have healthy relationships. And I think that, that that's something that many parents understand. Yeah, maybe you yeah. have to put the parents through a course before um, they start their child in school. <laughs> that's not a bad idea. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm like, kind of like, you know, this is talking about uh, the, the question that Chilong has just answered uh, from 
from the teacher's perspective of the parent being competitive. Now, I think this is a question from a parent. As a parent with children um, in a very traditional school setting, what is the best way to start advocating compassion and mutual respect in those schools? What is the best way to approach this in a school to teachers? So now the parent wants his child to be happy and they say, how can I tell the teachers because they have a different approach that this is what I want for my child? So maybe Kevin, would you take that? Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. It's coming from the, the opposite uh, direction, which is, which is wonderful. I, I think it, and I think it applies equally from both sides, from a school side or a parent side. It starts by what you focus on. So as a, as a school leader, if you focus on, let's say, your newsletter that goes out every week, if the thing you mention is top academic results and, and achievements, if that's the thing that you mention last mm. and you mention all the good other things, the, the, the kind acts, some volunteering, some uh, community work, if those are the first things that you mention and you focus, then you're slowly going to begin to change the culture. I think the same thing applies as a parent. If you're going to parent-teacher conferences, you're having these conversations mm. with the teachers. If you're not, if if quite often the the first, we want to know how our kids are going. What did they get on the last math exam? How are they travelling? How are they compared to their classmates? Are they better? Mm. Are they worse? Are they smarter? If we change that narrative and you focus on the things that are important to you, you know, is my child kind in class? Do they help mm. others? Um, mm. Are they you know, do they help you as the teacher? How can I better support and work with you and complement these things at home? And then that teacher knows what your uh, focus areas are and what's important to you as a, as a parent, as a family. And that kind of thing can get some momentum. It, it can then become pervasive if more of those conversations are the norm throughout a school community. Yeah, I mean, just a, a personal experience um, when, when uh, one of my uh, children who went to a different school from the other. So the others had gone to a much more traditional kind of, we go to parent teachers meetings and it's all about the marks. And um, this school didn't give us any report on the marks. And in my first term, I felt really lost. I'm like, I don't know how my child is doing. And I asked the teacher, the child, the teacher said, oh, he's a very good, kind boy. He's very helpful. And I'm thinking to myself, no, I want to know what marks he's got. <laughs> needed re-education and of course you know that child really has come up to be you know a very kind compassionate and successful boy so we yeah, have totally emphasized so now we're going to society at large so we have a question from Julian. how do you bridge consistency in practicing and modeling between what is shared or practiced in school and at home um, to reduce mixed messages to young learners and perhaps also with practices in society. So yeah, now it's kind of the bridge between what society expects of that child and what is happening in school and at home and how do we bridge that? Brilliant. Can I put that to you? Um. Colin? Oh, sorry. Do you want, <laughs> um, okay, well, I mean, First thing is to sort of recognize, accept, and be comfortable with that um, one of the purposes of, of education in schools is to uh, present uh, things that won't necessarily be known about at home and recognize their home. Um, and part of growing up, that kind of individuation, recognizing your relationship with your family uh, is unique. And uh, of course, you will. You, you will learn fresh perspectives constantly through what you, what you formally learn at school and what you informally learn at school through the socialization process. So this, this is to be welcomed and, and accepted. Um, and I think, um, particularly as the, the young people get older, when you're able to have some of those, I love working with teenagers myself, when you're able to have those kind of conversations about, well, look, you know, mum and dad say this, or my brother says that, because uh, we had a lot of that in Birmingham uh, when we, we had those, those issues around uh, socially very conservative values being put forward about dress codes, what should be in the curriculum, whether boys and girls should be doing PE together beyond a certain age, these kind of questions. Um, they, this, this is where really authentic social learning happens, where you have that dis 
discussion in school. So I don't think it's it's fighting shy of it. The, 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 the downside to this, and I know nobody here on the panel would do this, is where you close off all, all debate about that and you focus on traditional academic subjects. And, and of course, by the laws of physics, you suppress any discussion. So it goes underground and it never finds its way out into a healthy sort of discourse at school. So I would say, um, bring these things into the mainstream of school life and celebrate difference. That's where the rights respecting award, for example, in terms of the two articles about the right to practice your own faith uh, within, within your own culture, that gives you a starting position where everyone is at the same level and bring, has something to bring to the table. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm a, I am aware, Kathleen, there's some great questions here. And a lot of this is about um, leading change in schools, about how you move from position A to position B. Uh, and we've already, Kevin was touching on the messaging there. Yes, if the school's newsletter is all about A star, A star, A star, well, guess what? That's going to be the mood music, you know, for everyone. If it's about, we did, we, we slept out last night to, to raise funds for homeless people in, in Birmingham. And I do see that. Uh, a lot of schools do that. Well, yeah, we'll get you very, very good academic results. But you know what? First and foremost, we care about our contributions to society. So you can move from one seemingly intractable position to another one quite quickly with the right leadership in, in the school and I, I, sorry that's a little bit rambling i've just been reading the chat lines and q and a's as we've been going thank you thank you and let, let's uh, maybe in the, maybe the final two questions let's get into what is topical now um uh, now let's see what has been voted up yes from azima Asi. How do we cultivate a culture of compassion in our classroom during this time of pandemic, where we do not have a physical classroom and everything is done online? Very topical. Um, anybody wants to have a go at that? Would it be Kevin? Yeah, well, I can, uh, I can offer a few comments just briefly. Look, it's, it's, it's hard and a lot of teachers have found it um, really challenging with that that physical distance and everything happening online i think um one thing that has helped to kind of uh bridge that gap is that everyone has been affected quite often when we're trying to teach kindness and compassion we're trying to get our children or young people to um empathize and, and put themselves in other people's shoes that are experiencing discomfort or um, disadvantage, but in the current pandemic, almost everyone is in that position in one way or another, experiencing that disadvantage. Or so it's a, it's a lot easier, I think, in that way for educators to connect with with kids at home around the common challenges that everyone is facing or, or going through. And and so there's that connection there that they can use as a platform to to build on and to start conversations and to start a dialogue and explore these ideas because it's something that everyone is, is going through. And that's quite a, uh, it's certainly not a desired situation, but it's a, a rare situation to possibly take advantage of and, and one of those perhaps silver linings of, of this pandemic. And just to add, uh, I would say it's a great opportunity because there are many, many people in need. So for example, mental health has become something that everybody talks about. And so if, in a sense, the, the dynamic of kindness is about recognizing other people in need, and in a sense, taking the responsibility and agency to help meet that need, that can happen in a classroom setting when then we are training our young people to think about how are my classmates doing? And my teacher, my teacher seems a bit stressed a bit tired, you know, as a student, can I offer words of encouragement? My parents seem very stressed, you know, doing Zoom sessions and looking after the kids at home, you know, they, they are probably stressed about their jobs, their businesses are affected during COVID. So as a, as a child, what can I do during this pandemic to encourage, support, you know, but again, I think it's that whole, it's, it's a, a formula of recognizing needs during the pandemic and then finding simple things that I can do, that I can act on in order to help meet those needs. Yeah, I, I think that it's so relevant. And we're so focused on kind of the well-being of the child. And 
you know, I think we need to focus on the well-being of the teachers as well and, and parents and to be able to um, get the children to start thinking about how is my teacher doing today and being kind to my teacher not just expecting my teacher to be kind to me. I yep. think that's so fun, such a fundamental thing to inculcate in children. Yep. Yeah. And um, we are really out of time. So there's a lot more questions, but um, yeah, I don't think we are. Do we want to take one more question? Are we good for that? But there seems to be, I mean, these questions have been voted up. So let, let me just quickly do one more. Um, there seems to be a huge concern about, um, is that, is it bullying? Or oh, is that just being voted? Um, it was just a question about how do I um, deal with bullying? I think using compassion. Yeah, I, I, I just typed a very brief uh, answer there, uh, Kathleen. Um, I think you have to start very young um, and teach children to care for one another, share with each other, be emotionally attendant to other children's moods if they arrive unhappy in the morning try and find out what, what what's happened and children uh we use the word explicitly can be explicitly taught to do that and then we can reward them as adults we can show our approbation or approval for 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 their actions so i think the key is to start young if you work in the secondary phase of education you can tell the children who are compassionate could they join you from different primary schools where primary schools have really had this on the front burner uh, uh, as a big part of their agenda some schools don't do this at all uh, and the young people arrive in secondary education or 11 12 years old uh not really emotionally equipped to understand how to work with the the new the new students they they, they greet in secondary so start young uh use the uh children's rights charter and all of those there's a wealth of knowledge there on the unicef sites on the rights respecting schools award um and there's no mystique to it. It's about consistency. It's about showing what you approve of and disapprove of. It's about young people emotionally taking charge of their own lives. And I think when you invest in this, if you, if you find this culture in you, you'll be surprised just how emotionally mature young children can be with each other. If they're given license, uh, agency, that word just used before, to, 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 to work like this and be with each other. Um, it's it's it, there's no mystique to this it's about just making sure it's the the warp and weft the mainstream of school activity exactly like kevin was saying some time back in chilong then overlay that i think we're all on the same page here yeah thank you so much everyone um kevin chilong do you have anything to add to this i just wanted to say i mean on the topic of bullying i remember about 15 years ago we were doing something in malaysia with UNICEF. And at that time, we became acquainted with a model called the model of shared concern. And, and I think that's a good example of, you know, um, uh, it, it's sort of an intervention program for those uh, children who are bullying, uh, in a sense, reconciling and connecting with uh, the victims of their bullying. Mm -hmm. And and again, it, it moves away from, I guess, a more traditional approach of let's just expel them. And it's just punishment and, you know, let's just do that. But, but shared concern, I think, would be a really good example. And all of you can sort of go back and Google search this, you know. But it's a really good example of the application of kindness and compassion in a bullying uh, intervention program. And, and getting the bullies, in a sense, to, to empathize, to, to it, it's almost like truth and reconciliation, isn't it? it it's the bullies taking responsibility and understanding that their actions, while fun to them, have consequences on other people. And so again, it, it's coming back to, you know, you need to see with the eyes of compassion. So the way you see the world needs to change. And, and you know, other students in the school are not just there for your entertainment or fun or, you know, as a target or for your own frustration and anger, you know, but that, that they are human beings like yourself. And so I think uh, that's a really good example, you know, just to illustrate, I think what Colin was, are sharing so shared concern i think is a good example and application and i would just <laughs> echo those comments just quickly uh, and i agree 100 percent um you know a, a, a very similar approach is restorative justice yep. practices and yep. basically it's it's a, centered around 
um, understanding the harm that you've caused and then repairing the harm. Yep. So what are you going to do to make this right? It's not about punishment because that doesn't work. That doesn't change people's behavior. If you're, if you're future focused, if you're worried about, okay, how can we make sure this doesn't happen again? Um, then you need to understand the harm that you've caused and then you need to repair that. And that, that's a large part of that is getting everyone in a, in a group together and, and working through these, uh, the issues or challenges that are being there. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a, uh, a tough approach. If you, if you haven't used it before, tough is in, um, you know, it takes a, a, a shift in mindset to, you know, you're really approaching things in a different way, but it, it's so much more positive outcomes as a result of it. So thank you very much. I think those are really useful. I think, you know, not just opinions, but actionable ideas and tools that you have suggested. It's been a great um, afternoon. We've learned a lot. And I think, yeah, um, just say a very big thank you to Professor Colin, to Dr. Go, and to Kevin uh, for all your insights this afternoon. And uh, so it's time for us now, if you've enjoyed the session and you want to read more, the book, Education for Survival, The Pedagogy of Compassion, uh, which is co-authored by Professor Colin, can be found using the link shared in the chat. I think it's available on Amazon and the link will be provided to you. And if you enjoyed today, the next event will be on the 9th of October on our value, Reach for Perfection. And we look forward to seeing all of you there again. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. And have a lovely rest of the day and a wonderful weekend. See you all soon.